Well, welcome back. I'm Derek Rapp, a proud board member of Research America and also a managing director at Rivervest Venture Partners, a life sciences venture capital firm in St. Louis, San Diego, and in Cleveland. I hope that you've been enjoying the day thus far. Uh, obviously, it was a significant adjustment for Research America to conduct the session entirely uh, virtually, uh, but it also provided some great opportunities. One was to have such a tremendous diversity of speakers from around the country and also to provide so many people the opportunity to participate in the forum who maybe otherwise would not have been able to travel to Washington DC and do it this way. So we're glad that you're with us. We will get on now to uh, our, our next panel. I'm sure you will find it very interesting as well. It's called The Science of Vaccine Confidence. Our moderator is Jenny LeRae, Research America's Vice President of Strategy and Communications. And the panel includes the following folks. Phyllis Arthur, Vice President for Infectious Diseases and Diagnostics Policy at Bio. Dr. Bruce Gellin, President of Global Immunization at the Sabin Vaccine Institute. Dr. Sander Kraus Quinn, the Senior Associate Director at the Maryland Center for Health Equity and Professor and Chair for Family Science at the University of Maryland. And finally, Dr. Todd Wolin, Advisory Board President for Shots Heard Around the World. You can pose questions for the Q&A portion of this discussion by using the Q&A feature in Zoom. So Jenny, I'll turn it now over to you. Thank you, Derek. And hello to my panelists. Thank you again for taking this time to uh, join me this afternoon. You know, public trust and confidence in a COVID vaccine has already come up multiple times uh, at the forum. Dr. Fauci mentioned it in his interview with Judy Woodruff as already a looming problem. On our last panel, which focused on vaccine development, referred to it a number of different times. I'm struck by this statement in a recent set of recommendations from the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Quote, science does not necessarily drive people to be vaccinated. Their identity, worldview, and social values often do. Or to rephrase the often quoted line from the movie Bull Durham, if we build it, how do we make sure they come? That's the focus of our panel today. And we're very fortunate that our, our panelists um, have been working on this issue of vaccine trust, tr trust and confidence for a long time. For better or worse, it's not a new issue. And we have some very good data that we can begin to work with, but more data is gonna be needed as well to have a successful rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine. So let's set the stage before the pandemic because I think it really influences where we are now. So what challenges were we facing in vaccination rates uh, in the population at large and also among different racial and, and ethnic groups? Bruce, why don't I start with you? Perhaps you could talk about pediatric uh, vaccine rates. So, th so, so Jenny, thanks for organizing this as we've a good discussion with our, our fellow panelists. You know, I think to take a step back is that what maybe is not appreciated is a program in the United States called the Vaccines for Children program that is now uh, 25 years old, I think. Um, and essentially that, that is a program that allowed vaccines to be given, that make it available to everyone. And that more than anything else has helped to, to improve the uptake of, of vaccination. We've relied on the healthcare practitioners of the country to deliver those vaccines. And essentially the CDC has been providing those vaccines for free into the refrigerators of the practitioners to, to supply more than half the country. And that's been a great, that's, that's helped to improve uptake generally and to, to minimize some of the disparities. So in general, we're doing pretty well with childhood immunizations. Um, it varies by vaccine, it varies by area. Um, probably 90% is a, is a good number to think about overall, but these national numbers sometimes hide pockets of, of, of differences. And when we've seen these outbreaks in the past, and measles, because it's so infectious and so explosive, identifies these communities where the, the rates were not uh, as high as they might be. So a year ago, just a year ago, we were having that conversation about 
outbreaks of measles in New York and other places in the country. And when you look at some of those subpopulations, you see that there have been um, a, a, a diminution of vaccine, but some of the vaccines. But in general, pretty high. We have pockets of under vaccination, but also we have increasing uh, concerns about vaccines. And just because people have more questions doesn't make them anti-vaccines. I think we've had, had become much more um, uh, aware of the kinds of questions people have, so we're prepared to answer them. Thanks, Bruce. And Sandra, I'm going to turn to you to talk a little bit about adult vaccination rates. Well, building on, on what Bruce just said, you know, it's interesting because the, the scene with adults is quite different. And so, you know, we've seen for a very long time disparities in adult vaccination rates and, you know, for seasonal flu, for pneumococcal disease, for tetanus and Tdap, um, and other um, Zoster, other adult vaccines. So always with with racial and ethnic groups um, lagging behind uh, white populations. That said, you know, if you look at, let's say, seasonal flu vaccine, which is really important right now, none of us, we do not as a nation, come anywhere close to the healthy people goals for flu vaccination. And why, you know, why is that? And certainly as Jenny, as you talked about trust, is a key issue, but there are some other things too. So there are certain, certainly individual and cultural beliefs about many of these diseases. And I study flu vaccine acceptance, that's certainly true. There are myths about vaccines. Um, and there are also some structural barriers. Unlike the, the vaccines for children, we don't have you know, a program that provides that same level of coverage for all adults. And we know that both perceptions about cost, about convenience, and I'll go one step further and say, perceptions about how, particularly if you're Black or Latin, Latinx, you know, how you may be treated in a healthcare system all come into play with regard to vaccine acceptance. Thank you, Sandra. Um, Phyllis, would you like to jump in there? So yeah, I'd add one thing. I think that actually Sandra covered a lot of the waterfront for why we have problems with adult vaccine rates versus pediatric. But I think also at the core, and this I think goes across racial, ethnicity, geography, et cetera, people, when you say vaccines to your basic person on the street, they instantly think pediatric. So I also think at the base, we have a general misconception that vaccines don't go across the lifespan. Even when people think about flu, a parent can say they're very committed to get their kids immunized for flu and then say that they aren't really thinking about vaccinating themselves. Um, so, so I think that to some degree, adult immunization suffers from a lack of general commitment about the risk we all face to infectious diseases. And one of the weird silver linings we could pull out of COVID-19 is for the first time ever, a whole bunch of adults are realizing that they're at risk of infectious diseases <laughs> and that there's reasons they should get vaccinated. Now we have other issues, but I do think adult vaccination suffers from a general view by most adults that they are not at risk. Phyllis, that is a great point. And we're actually gonna to return to that a little bit later. Um, one of the things that I find fascinating is that vaccine trust is also a global issue. So it was, you know, among the WHO's uh, most serious public health threats last year. And given the wide variety of cultures and societies around the world, why is there a common thread around vaccine trust? I know, Bruce, you've done some work with uh, Welcome Trust. Perhaps you can comment on that. Well, well I think that the, the broader picture, and I'll get to the, the work that Welcome Trust did, is that, that, that immunization programs essentially rely on trust. They rely on the trust of parents to understand the needs of, the, of vaccines and to their bring, their, bring their children into a system and for adults as well. Because you're asking people who are well to come and get a medical procedure that's gonna prevent, prevent something down the road that they may not see. So trust, in, trust and confidence are central to this. And the idea that you're trusting everything from the integrity of the research, the quality of the science, the re regulatory apparatus that ensures that only the products that are deemed safe and effective go forward, and trust in those who make recommendations. So I think trust is central to it, and that's not an American thing. That's, that's central to immunizations. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, a year or so ago, the Welcome Trust, that's the name of the organization, 
put out something called the, the Trust Monitor. And they looked at the issues of, of the trust in science and science and technology, and with a particular emphasis on, on immunizations. Um, and it's a, it's a fascinating, and, I, and I, we, we have it in the, uh, in, the, in the goodie bag for people to take a look at, but it's a, it was a survey of over 140,000 people for 100, 140 countries looking at the issue of trust. I think particularly for the Research America audience, you'll be glad to know that 73% of people trust in scientists. They didn't necessarily have a person in mind, but trust in the people who do it. Um, yet more than half, the, half that group didn't really think that they knew much about science. With vaccinations, trust overwhel overwhelmingly was pretty high with differences in different countries. It's worth a look at their report, but I think the important piece is this is an issue everywhere. At Sabin, we've just launched a vaccine acceptance and demand program. Sabin focuses on lower and middle income countries and trying to work with the, with the immunization programs on the ground to better understand what those issues are so we can improve the uptake of vaccines, particularly where trust and confidence are central. So even though vaccine trust is a global issue, and we're gonna to get to this in a moment, we need very micro-targeted messages and micro-targeted approaches. Um, am I right about that? Uh, these are, these are, this is, at a com at communities are different in different places. Uh -huh. Communities because they share values. Uh, and I think that's what we see everywhere. I'd mentioned before the outbreaks of measles in the United States in some communities, but not all. So again, it, it speaks to the, uh -huh. we just need to understand what's going on locally, which is why having uh, information and evidence from the ground is really important. Terrific. Um, so also pre-COVID, I think there were a lot of common mis uh, misconceptions about people who were hesitant uh, to be vaccinated. Um, and so I wanted to get into that and also talk about how the social and behavioral research has helped us to better address those attitudes. But First, Todd, I'm going to turn to you. Um, if you could maybe help kind of break down um, what comprises the, the different um, groups within the vaccine confidence trust continuum. Yep, yep. And as, as Bruce just referenced, there's good data country to country to, that the general population still trusts vaccines. And, and U.S. data and, and world health data shows that at least in the US, we consider about 75% of the population being vaccine accepting, meaning you make a recommendation and they're willing to just go ahead and accept it. 23% or so are vaccine hesitant and only one to 2% are anti-vaccine. 23% being hesitant doesn't mean that they don't wanna get vaccinated nor does it mean that they won't vaccinate the same day, but they have questions and we shouldn't uh, consider that a bother. We shouldn't consider that a threat we need to be better trained in communication to better address their questions and have really good active listening skills. That's great. Um, and Todd, could you also just touch where the anti-vax movement fits in here? You know, yeah, or do they get too much attention, too little? Um, how should we be thinking? And also how should we be thinking about them now? Yeah. In this so, moment? So interesting, right? Everybody thought if, if there was any silver lining to COVID, it was, wow, this is, a, this is what the planet looks like with 0% herd immunity, essentially. I mean, essentially. And, uh, and they thought, man, this will be easy. Everybody's going to win a vaccine. And lo and behold, a very well-organized uh, group of anti-vaccine forces or people, whatever you want to call it, they're organized, they have strategy, they're well-funded, and they, even though I said represent one to 2% punch well above their weight. Why? Well, because I just said they're organized and they're funded, but they also have um, leveraged the most important tool there is to leverage right now, which is social media. And, and what we don't often get out there to talk about them is their ulterior motives. While they say, oh, we're here for safety or to keep government out of your life. In fact, in a big part, they're driven by profit. They're driven by political gain and also by power or people trying to get us to distrust institutions. So they were there before COVID, but they've capitalized on the pandemic in a way that we still are playing catch up and are not prepared yet to deal with. And, and that's what our, I think all of us are working on. Thanks, Todd. Does anyone want to jump in on, on that point? Go ahead, go, go ahead, go ahead, sir. 
Okay, I would jump in here. Sure. Um, and some of our research on vaccine narratives and social media, I mean, I would agree absolutely with Todd that they punch above their weight. And part of it is, you know, that you need to have your message amplified. And they're, they're masterful at doing that. And then in the media, we, in the more traditional media, we also amplify it as well. So I think that's one thing, but I, I want to raise one other thing that I think is one of our big challenges right now is that we really don't have, you know, there will be people who, who this is what they do for a living, but a local health department or a state health department does not have a group of people sitting around waiting to respond. So we have two things we need. One is what are the best strategies to respond? And I think we still need significant research on that. And then secondly, how do we help our institutions like lo local and state health departments, uh, the CDC respond in ways that are effective and feasible given their resources? Mm -hmm. That's so, a really good point. It, Phyllis? I agree with that. I think in our, our work over the last year and a half on this issue at Bio, we've come to understand as well, though, that what we really need are a set of well-equipped advocates who stand toe-to-toe -to -toe in terms of representing similar populations, that we have a little bit of a messenger issue here. Um, and so there's no question in the states where a lot of this is being dog, is normally the dog fights normally in the states, but now we're at this national conversation. There's an, we, we've, we've had great doctors and nurses turn up, you know, the public health departments, et cetera. That's great. Those folks can talk about this in a very scientific and clear way. What they're missing is that emotional punch. And it is very hard to take the microphone after a mother who in tears, rightly or wrongly so, has decided that what happened to her child, which is extraordinarily important, was caused by the vaccine that child got. You can't stand up, you can't be dismissive of that. You can't, you, you gotta, you gotta own that communication. And so I think one of the things that's vital is educating and arming parents and grandparents, people who've seen these diseases, people who understand it, people who have children who are immune compromised and thus need to be surrounded. There's a reason why people need to be vaccinated at school and daycare, et cetera. Those people need to stand up and say, understand that story, but here's my story. There are consequences to undoing this public health initiative and those consequences are not worth it and here's why. And I think that's one of the things that many organizations have been working on um, and we're trying to have more concerted effort, effort around, but it's, it's hard to hit emotion with science without giving that science some emotion around it. I think that's key here. Well, I could great Bruce, bridge on that. Yeah. And this session is entitled The Science of Vaccine Confidence. And I think that what, the, what Phyllis is saying, you know, that, that the science is important, but the data don't speak for themselves and the data are not terribly compelling. It's the stories that are. So I think that's where we get into the broader science, so the, the importance of social science and mm -hmm. behaviors. Because you can tell people all the facts you want and you can get louder and louder and louder <laughs> they'll hear. But it's, all, it's really, it's the emotional side. It's trying to understand that which is why really trying to think through how do we broaden the, the, the scientific input here to include the social and behavioral sciences as a multidisciplinary problem solving because risk communication by itself coupled with some data elements wasn't doing it. And, and can I add to what Bruce just said? I, I, I actually think that science is still important, but I also think we've been communicating our science in a way that's too sciencey. And I'll give you a perfect example, right? We were, we've all been talking about herd immunity for the last years, million years, right? We all talk about it. But think about when COVID happened and many of the TV stations showed the golf balls, right? The, the, the balls that show how people connect, how quickly and easy it is to pass disease between people simply, right? The, we need to think about ways to communicate scientific principles in a way that's much more literate for people so they get the core concept. So I think as a public health community, we tend to talk about these things like epidemiologists and that's not even, that's, that's not, that's not resonating as, as clearly as if we sort of made these uh -huh. examples simpler for people to understand. I still believe firmly in the scientific space wherein it's got lots and lots of data. And that group of 
the group of non-hesitant people that 75 percent target they they are committed to vaccines because there's all this data and they, they like that and um, the hesitant are trying to understand that data how can we make that data easier for people to chew on and and make decisions well todd you've had to do this like really on the ground in your pediatric practice um Tell just us how that how you've handled this just this morning i had a physician assistant student at my side i said let's go into this room we were seeing uh, i think the child was about uh, six months old and we got through the visit and i said to mom um, the flu vaccine's coming in next week we have flu clinics set up and she goes oh yeah no i'll do the six month vaccines today but i'm not coming back for that i don't get that that vaccine and went on to tell me with good communication skills and active listening that her um, child that was a couple years older got the flu vaccine once and it took months for him to get better. He had cold after cold and just seemed to not clear up and she blamed the flu vaccine. And I said, I really appreciate you explaining to me your concern. And then she kind of allowed me to then share with her that, you know, the flu vaccine has nothing infectious in it. But more importantly, I was able to weave in some narrative. And I said, you know, I, I, I do a lot of work with vaccines and I got to see this group called Families Fighting Flu and this mom who held a picture up of her 17 year old who's a varsity baseball playing kid who hated going to the doctor. And she said, she'll never forget the day saying, I, I need to go to the hospital. And, and he died within 24 hours of flu. And the room got very quiet and she all of a sudden got quite serious. And I said, you know, two years ago, we lost about 180 kids to flu. 80% of those kids were unvaccinated. I could weave in data after I had had a chance to put some narrative in there. And I'll tell you what, it got quiet she got very serious and you know i don't know if she's going to come back next week but because we didn't have the flu vaccine today but i've done that on multiple occasions including using stories of friends of mine who had hpv and said this is my last round of chemo if this doesn't work mm -hmm. i have nothing left how do you that that's a, that's a story that's very compelling then you can put data in there yeah very compelling sandra i want to go back to you and talk about um, the social and behavioral research um, that you've so excelled at. And I know that you've looked at vaccine acceptance during other public health emergencies. I'm thinking of H1N1. What did you learn that is relevant to our situation today? Well, thanks, Jane. I mean, I think there are a number of things that are relevant more than, than we're going to have time for. So I'm going to hit on a couple of them. When, you know, when I think to the H1N1 pandemic, it was 2009, 2010, it feels like a lifetime ago in terms of where we were as a country. Um, but a couple of things we learned, you know, then for sure, and I've seen it repeated in my vaccine disparities work since then. Trust in government's important. And actually trust at that time um, in CDC and FDA was pretty high. Um, trust in local, when, when, when it came to talking about H1N1, talking about the uh, vaccine, trust in uh, elected officials, not so much. Um, so, but trust in public health officials at that time was higher. But I want to make some distinctions in terms of what we've seen also then and over time, and that, you know, that that's in some of the work that whites tended to trust the competence of government. African Americans tended to be more concerned about the motives of government and do you have our best interest at heart as a community. So I think we need to be cognizant of that. We certainly saw, you know, when it looked like the H1N1 vaccine might be an emergency use authorized vaccine when it might have an adjuvant, as it turns out, it did go through the standard approval process and licensing, licensing but that there was very low willingness to accept um, a vaccine. So that um, raises real concerns for where we are now. But there is another thing we explored by doing two national surveys, one early in the pandemic, one a little bit later in January and February, and that was the importance of talking about uncertainty, that we really assessed whether knowing that there was going to be uncertainty, being prepared for uncertainty, changed perceptions of the quality of communication and trust. And that also is important for today because it really did. If people knew it, if they believed things were gonna change, that didn't mean there was a problem. It just meant that science changes that that was really helpful in 
also predicting trust and acceptance. So those are a couple of key things that I think are valuable for us today. Thank you, Sandra. Well, I want to continue to move to the moment we're in um, and talk about, given your expertise, what are the really critical elements we need in a successful COVID-19 vaccination rollout? Um, and I know a number of you are advising policymakers on this right now. Um, and um, this is a great opportunity. I know we have a number of congressional staff um, viewing this and others. Uh, so I think this is a good time to have that conversation um, with, with all of you. Um, so I know one issue that has come up is how providers are brought into this process. So how do we bring in doctors, nurses, public health workers, those who are really gonna be administering the vaccines and those on the front lines answering questions about the vaccines? How do we bring them in? What do they need to know? Um, who wants to take that on first? Todd? I always say it doesn't matter anymore how good of a diagnostician you are if you make the right uh, treatment decision if you're not uh, gonna be believed, right? And if you can't communicate it well. And, and you know, medical curriculum is still being taught with a false assumption that everybody is gonna believe healthcare providers. And <laughs> Bruce and I've had a back and forth on pheochromocytomas, but they're, you know, you can be damn sure you're gonna get two board questions on pheochromocytoma and you're gonna study an endocrine tumor, nothing against endocrinologists that you likely won't see, or maybe you'll see, but if you don't, you're still gonna refer. But we're not taught on communication. We're not taught to use social media. As a matter of fact, social media is considered by a lot of people beneath us. We don't go there. Oh, there's HIPAA. But that's how anti-vaccine movement, the anti-vaccine movement is winning. As a matter of fact, the paper from Johnson that just came out said that anti-vaccine groups are growing at a faster rate and they're, and they're more woven through the fabric of social media. And their, <laughs> one of their final conclusions were, we need to build our own network. The network exists. We have hundreds of thousands of healthcare providers, probably millions when you add up all ancillary staff who are trusted. We already saw the data. We're trusted. We have enormous trust but we, we squander this trust because we don't engage our, our community outside the four walls of the exam room. And, and how many people can you really see there? And even there, face-to-face, -face, we're not given good training. So face-to-face -face training is, is one piece that needs to be improved and there's methodologies that, that improve that. And two, social media to leverage or, or to, to escalate and amplify our message like Phyllis had talked about. Very helpful. Um, Phyllis, you look like you're ready to jump in. I'm, I'm always ready to talk. Um, so, <laughs> so Bruce knows that. I think that with regard to your question about who we're training to do what, I think it's pivotal actually that we, the science community and the government start training all the different healthcare professionals that are going to be answering questions about this vaccine now. Uh, my understanding is healthcare providers of all ilks and all stripes are already being asked to explain this vaccine. And they're not necessarily understanding how the clinical trials are being done, how diversity is going to be served, uh, the differences in the different vaccine types. Some of the, so, the, you know, in, in conversations we've been having with the U.S. government and CDC, there needs to be a concerted effort to give the learned intermediary information between now and the availability of You cannot do this when the doses are in the truck. That is way too late. You have to do this right now. People are already asking. Many of the hesitant are just hesitant because they don't have good information, not because they don't they're not feeling anti-government or whatever. They really just need to have information. And then we're undoing for, for many of the population who are at most risk, who are seeing a healthcare provider, we have to take more time to undo the socio, sociologic determinants of why they were already anti-vaccine, right? So you can't dig out of a hole that goes back to Tuskegee or beyond in like oh. a week or a day. You, you really have to give those, um, those messengers the information they need right now. And the focus should really be on the learned intermediaries giving them four or five things that they can easily explain to people right this minute. Um, and, and how can we be doing that? Because we've got to undo mm -hmm. a lot of misunderstanding. I'm not even calling it misinformation, just lack of understanding or misunderstanding. Thank I, you, I, men I, mentioned, I mentioned the, uh, the welcome trust monitor previously. Globally and in the United States, the vast majority of people 
are going to trust the people in the white coats, the people who are you're normally going to go to to translate science into practice. So I think we need to take, make a concerted effort now to start doing exactly what Phyllis said, is those who are going to be holding the syringes need to be read in. They need to know everything about, and it, you know, it's, it's complex science that's still emerging, but transparency of the science that's going on now about those clinical trials, the data that's going to go forward to the FDA about consideration of that, all that needs to be packaged in a way so that the, the practitioner holding the syringe can with confidence express the science that's brought that vaccine to their, to their practice. Without Thanks. that, I think the practitioners mm -hmm. like to be, able to be skeptical and you can know that you know how that's going to go. Thanks, Bruce. Um, you know, we're, we're getting to a point that uh, Phyllis raised earlier that Todd mentioned on the phone last week, and that's the difference between pediatricians and adult GPs or internists in terms of their vaccination experience. Um, and I really hadn't hadn't occurred to me. I haven't seen that written about, but it's it's such a compelling pivotal issue. Todd, could you share um, your concerns about that? Yeah, and I, look, some of my best friends are adult doctors. <laughs> but, it's nothing but, against adult doctors. It's <laughs> their experience as vaccinators. Uh, yeah, I know, but I, I mean, I'm not trying to be disparaging, but they aren't the main vaccinators in our country, right? In the United States, the doses are delivered in the pediatric office, not at the public health clinic, not at the hospital, and not typically by adult docs. As a matter of fact, we know data from like when chickenpox vaccines were rolled out <clears throat> and what family medicine docs were able to do compared to pediatric docs. And pediatricians are most skilled at cold chain, making recommendations, documenting, charting, reconciling doses. To put this load now of which COVID vaccine, did you get a second dose? Where'd you get it? Where should it be administered? Who's keeping track of it? Who's, who's comfortable in making the recommendation and discussing vaccines? We're putting a burden, right? The first wave of immunizations, I would imagine, are gonna be adults 18 and older, All not, kids, not pregnant women. And so you're asking the probably least confident or frequent vaccinators to do the most vaccinating this first wave. So we need to, rec we need to come to grips with that and figure out how to best support them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. At yeah, this, on the flip side, those people actually will have seen the disease yes. more than the other. Oh. So in terms of telling a compelling story, an internist oh. that had patients yeah. die can do what Todd was talking about before, weave the narrative into mm. the recommendation. But I agree, they have not been strong recommenders in the past. They're usually like shared decision maker types and, and they need to be mm -hmm. shorn up as vaccinators. But as experientially, they should probably be very good. And, and I'll say it. our point. people. Oh, sorry, yeah. No, Todd, finish what you're going to In our say. pediatric practice, we've been immunizing adults for flu for years, again, because uh -huh. we're trusted. They're right there. They trust us with their most prized possession, their kids. And so the vast uh -huh. majority of parents are like, oh, yeah, I'd love to get it here. And it's a very easy um, uh -huh. uh, environment for us to recommend the vaccine and for them to accept it. So, uh, Sandra, I think you, you've been wanting to get in on this. Yeah, I wanted to follow with something that both Todd and Phyllis said. And, and, you know, but the important part is what we know from some of the literature is that, let's say, African-American adults go in during the season, but they're not getting a recommendation and offer at the same visit. And so, Todd, what you're describing is not just, you know, communicating about it, but you're making it easier, dealing with the issue of convenience for those parents. So I think, and, and I think the other thing we know is the issue of who's a role model. So if you're going in, and I've had these conversations with providers when I go in and I say, are your patients taking the flu vaccine? How about your African-American patients? And then they say, well, I don't take it myself. I'm going. Oh, no. You know, <laughs> being a role model is important. But I want to come back to one other thing that I think is really distinctive here and is really vital, is we, we, we've been seeing it in the paper for weeks, we heard it in the panel prior to this, that it is very possible that, that whatever vaccines are first out of the chute and safe and effective are likely to be um, emergency use authorized vaccines. And I, I say that because I totally agree that all of these providers need to be cognizant and ready to talk about the vaccine, but they also need to understand what that means. There will be an FDA fact sheet providers. There will be one for patients who get it. 
they're not necessarily written in language that's going to be helpful to our cause of getting people to take the vaccine. So I think we also have to bring all those providers into the mix so that they can answer well, what is an EUA and how is this different and, and what am I seeing in this fact sheet. So that's a vital piece of this. Very important. Mm -hmm. um, something else that um, I think, Phyllis, you and I discussed last week when, when we were on the phone was that um, the information to lay audiences, which can come from providers in terms of the prioritization of the vaccine, mm -hmm. you talked about how it could be that occupation and demographic data may, might be a more uh, useful um, justification than race and ethnicity when you're talking to the American public. Could you s say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think absolutely. So we were watching the way the ACIP process is starting to lay out the prioritization, knowing that there won't be 300 million doses available right at the beginning, that there'll be some sliding scale and wanting to go in, an, in, a, in a scientific approach to allocation of the vaccines. So what I, I like, what I think is strong about the way the ACIP is doing it is they're looking at it based on risk and they're looking at that in a, in a way that lays, overlays occupation risk, medical risk, and therefore leads to some discussion of racial and ethnic risk or underserved population risk, as opposed to going out and saying, everyone who's African-American is at risk. In actuality, part of the reason why we're seeing so many African-Americans impacted is partly because of the jobs they have that don't allow them to stay home during the COVID outbreak. So I think they took a very logical approach that doesn't lead to racial targeting. Mm -hmm. It leads to a prioritization that allows you to have a better risk conversation. So. I'm, I'm an African-American woman with two underlying conditions, but I'm able to stay home. I should not be on the front list. Others who are actually doing essential work, healthcare workers who may meet the criteria should be, but it could be explained to them in terms of being in those risk factors. And, and, and unfortunately or fortunately, that gives you to some degree that diverse demography because of those jobs. And I, I think that's a that's an approach that I think is more evidence-based and allows for recommendations that are easier to explain. And, and as far as the easiness to explain, this is a very complex area because <laughs> essentially this is, I mean, I, I can't imagine a more complicated pro issue than explaining why you're not first in line. But there has to be a process because as Phil has said, there's not gonna be enough vaccine on day one. It'll take a while until there's sufficient. And yet there's this, there needs to be a discussion about what's the rationale behind this. And that's another part of that conversation that the people in the front lines need to be able to understand and communicate. Because some of say, how come that person got to go first and I didn't? Phyllis just gave a great example of why there would be a clear rationale for why she doesn't go first in line, although other people might make an argument why she should. So explaining that process of who's important to society for those reasons is pretty complicated. But just having this posted at the National Academy of Sciences and hoping that people read it isn't gonna happen. This also needs to be translated down so the people on the front lines can explain the rationale. Hopefully the people can understand why they're where they are in, in line while we're waiting for vaccine to be produced. And this is, we're gonna to go to questions in a minute, um, but this is really among the sort of social behavioral uh, type of research that really needs to be um, incorporated, um, you know, at, at at a very detailed level in, in the rollout. Um, well, I think we are gonna go to questions. Um, before we do though, I have to make an admission. You know, I started off the session talking about vaccine trust, and I think I may have misled a few people because I quoted the wrong movie. <laughs> so I have actually gotten several um, texts and emails, and um, of course the movie is Field of Dreams, not Bull Durham. Kevin Costner, I think, was in both. This is very 1990s. We're going to move on now, but I just needed to own own that. Uh, since you know, Jenny, you should have said you were just testing to make sure people were paying attention. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Okay, so my colleague Caitlin has joined us, and she is going to uh, ask us some of the questions that our attendees have have posted. 
Hi, thanks. Uh, yeah, so we have a couple of questions in the chat. You can go ahead and pop them in the Q&A um, if you want to continue the conversation. Um, the first question is, how do we balance, and this goes into the social sciences that we were just discussing, how do we balance the fact that acknowledging uncertainty is critical for building trust, um, as Todd mentioned, but also that human decision making is vulnerable to doubt? So Jenny, maybe you can determine, or, or Todd can take I, can I Can I start with that one? Because I say, I think that, and I don't quite know how this happened, I wasn't part of it, but in every other situation I've been in, where there was a, a national issue of public health significance, the first thing that you would hear from CDC was, we're gonna tell you what we know, we're gonna tell you what we don't know, and we're gonna tell you what we're working on to try to fill in those gaps. Exactly. We should expect the science is gonna evolve, so what we're telling you now might be different later. That is missing from the anchor of this whole discussion. <laughs> Completely. Without that, that, that sort of lays out that uncertainty is a part of this. We can't, we're not gonna dismiss it. We certainly shouldn't pretend we know everything. I mean, I, you know, I've known Dr. Fauci for a long time and he is clearly the expert in infectious diseases. And he's the first to tell you how this is a virus unlike anything he's seen in his 40 years of doing this. So I think that this, we need to acknowledge that because uncertainty is part of the narrative. And if we paper over that, we're gonna be in trouble. Let me add to that, Bruce, because I absolutely agree. There's, you know, Richard Besser said it at the beginning of H1N1 pandemic, and he laid it out in a beautiful paragraph. But I'll say another thing is with that, it's really helpful if our leadership, be it scientific or and elected and, and community, were able to recognize and say with some empathy, we know that's hard. We know that's gonna make people uncomfortable. We recognize that and we're keep, you, we're keep you informed, we're keep telling you what we know. So I think when we do that, you know, we really are setting up something where that's not an immediate oppositional, oh, they must be wrong. They were wrong, which is what we've been seeing for months now. And, and it's incredibly destructive. And the corollary here, again, I think for your audience, I'll just be brief here, is, is that scientists are used to watching science. We know that it's one step forward, two steps sideways, one step back, three steps forward, and eventually you get to truth, or you hope you come close to truth. Mm -hmm. Watching science like this, which is a typhoon of data, where it's changing every day, and there's mm -hmm. every issue is laid out, and watching science in real time is not for the timid. And I think that's part of the issue is having watched all this with this volume of information, which is again, self-correcting, if you will, it's, it's difficult where I worry that people think, well, these experts really don't know. So I'm going to do what I want to do because, you know, they tell me, they told me something different yesterday than today. So I'm just going to go ahead because they don't really know. But I think you wanted to jump in and then we'll go to the next question. Yeah, I, I, what I was going to say is as important as any virologist, vaccinologist, immunologist, any of the training that I've gotten in the basic sciences as people doing the work just like Sandra is, <clears throat> which is kind of risk decision making, communication science, social science. And it's why we work with the group over at the University of Pittsburgh School of Public Health that um, the anti-vax group is not limited, right, by, by logic or facts. And and we as humans are hardwired for risk, right? That's how we've survived and thrived as a species. And so we're hardwired. And when something scary comes out, no matter how fantastical, you actually, the more fantastical, the better, it, 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 it grabs our attention and it resonates. And, you know, we uh, as scientists talk about 95% confidence intervals. We don't use narrative and we quickly lose people. And the only way we can counter this kind of fear and oftentimes mixed with hate is with trust. And we have the trust. Everybody keeps quote, quoting, we're trusted, we're trusted, we're trusted. What the hell are we doing with the trust? We are not trained to communicate and we absolutely don't use social media in a, in a powerful way. So we're squandering it. We, we have the solution. We just haven't mobilized the, the silent majority. Well, I think that feeds nicely into some more questions from our audience, which I'll just um, try to summarize a few that we've gotten that are of similar um, vein, which is, um, where would you point to resources to build more trust in communities of color? And also, um, what are the ways that we can make use of social media to promote confidence and to combat misinformation? I'll, I, I, 
Can I jump in? Yes. Okay, I'll jump in here and, and I see other faces here, people wanting to respond as well. I mean, so, you know, having started my career working on the impact of the Tuskegee study on HIV prevention and attitudes in, in uh, the black community, you know, number one is I think one of the ways we need to address this is investing in the social and behavioral science and the community engaged research to build the partnerships or build upon existing partnerships with diverse communities. And, you know, it may be with a faith community leader, a minister, an imam, it may be with um, fraternities, sororities, civic organizations. So I know, because we have been able to do it in other places, is that investing resources in building partnerships is vital to building that trust. And that begins right now. I mean, it should have begun years ago, but it be, certainly begins right now with the clinical trials and then goes on through getting all those community leaders, formal and informal, ready to talk about this vaccine. And I, and I, as a, vaccine, a flu vaccine person, I gotta say, and ready to talk about the flu vaccine this fall. Uh -huh. Anybody else want to jump in on that? So I think someone said something in the chat that was really important, which is um, that the communities of color right now are the target of the anti-vax movement. And so it is pivotal to do what Sandra just said in great earnest, because I do think there are faith-based leaders and, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, not celebrities, but, you know, radio leaders and others that are well-respected who want to, like, do a good job, for example, on diabetes education, right? They know that's important. Those same people should be engaged to do education here and be given the right information so that they are not prone to misinformation, which, you know, the anti-vaxxers have figured out, this is a place to drive a wedge. Um, there's a political issue, there's the, you know, the, the socioeconomic issue, the social justice issue has become a, a wonderful wedge here that I think to Todd's earlier point, really is not meant to serve that population per se, it's meant to serve the cause of anti-vax, but mm -hmm. it's, it's being very geopolitically targeted in a, in a very smart way. And we've got to pull those folks back from the brink because they're at risk of this misinformation. Phyllis, is the Stronger campaign, which you haven't mentioned yet, but right, we right. have links so, to it. Right. It's the Stronger campaign, which I think Todd's also involved in. Mm -hmm. um, could you say a little bit about that? And then is that getting into um, some of these issues around um, racial justice? So, so to some, so, so yes, so the Stronger Campaign has been stood up by Bio along with other partners. Um, it's really meant to help pe help people who are advocates for vaccines of all walks of life actually help acknowledge and point out and to somebody very quickly debunk misinformation on vaccines. So it's not meant to get into the, you know, scientific back and forth, but to point people who want to be involved in debunking misinformation to the right information from great not-for-profit websites and the CDC and others, but also help them just have the confidence and understanding of the knowledge enough to say, when they see something bad on Facebook, hey, just want to point to you, this is wrong, here's places to go to get real information, and the answer is actually X. Um, and so that's what Stronger is for. They have been doing all things on why you wear a mask. They, they're, they're, it's a public health campaign meant to really get all of us advocates who care about public health engaged. And as we move forward, our work will be to try to increase its connections to many more communities to get at misinformation across more people than just the people in it right now. Todd, I see your hand up. Yeah, along with the, what Phyllis is saying, it's a sophisticated campaign stronger in that it, it really aims at disinformation, right? Disinformation against science, medicine, and vaccines. And it's exactly like Phyllis said it, it serves up the answers there. And, and the reason after our group got attacked um, that we formed shotsheard.org uh, is, is to really focus on leveraging that trust that we talked about with healthcare providers, which our goal is to, to support, <clears throat> defend, empower, and galvanize, really start building the ranks of vocal healthcare providers. And, um, and I see some in the chat right now, like Nicole Baldwin, They're, they can become uber advocates. And the goal is not to reach people in New Zealand. 
just to reach your community. They already see you and trust you physically in the office. They're, they they have that relationship where they see you daily in your office, place of worship, grocery store, food drive. They just are waiting to hear from us. And yet, I'm going to say it again, we aren't doing anything to leverage social media. And that is the most efficient and effective way. We'd have limited resources to reach and educate people. Todd, you made a point um, when we spoke last week about how the anti-vax movement tends to go to vulnerable targets. And when your practice really started, you know, getting your supporters to um, defend you and, and respond back, they did move on to another target. Yeah, they, we, we, we like to say when they picked on us, they picked on the wrong group because we had a production studio, we had a communications director, and we had communications expertise combined with a firm knowledge. We did clinical vaccine research for 14 years. We are actively back involved now doing vaccine research and, and vaccine confidence. And so uh, again, I'll point to uh, Nicole Baldwin, I'll point to Brad Bigford, people who have now become parts of Shots Heard, who don't back down. With the, it's kind of like soft targets versus hard targets. <laughs> soft targets are pretty much 99% of healthcare offices, whether it's a onesie twosie practice or even the quaternary health system with a nine person communications team who was told to go silent on vaccines headed into flu season by their CEO and CFO for fear of a social media attack. Literally went silent, contacted us after we were on the cover of the LA Times saying, how do we go to the CEO and CFO and tell them this is the wrong decision? And as a result of what we've done and what Shots Heard is doing now, we've been able to create hardened targets <clears throat> that are vaccine advocates that stand their ground, that don't take their post down. And those people, after being attacked once, and now we've tracked this with several groups, they never get attacked again. Whereas other groups, they take their post down, they cower away, and they are celebrated in the oh. anti-vaccine groups like yeah, yeah. What we got them to do. Caitlin, do we have any other questions from the audience? I have another question. Um, in the social science context, can you point to vaccination campaigns that have been successful and those that were not successful and what were the differences between those? Mm -hmm. I, I, I can start just, um, well, because I, I believe Sandra will probably think of some cool things when she has <laughs> been. Um, but, uh, so, so I think actually that the National Immunization, the National Adult and Influenza Immunization Summit actually has a series of rewards, awards that actually reward community-based activities that drive immunization rates. And I, I, I sit on the committee that, that judges those each year. And I'll say the ones that stand out to me are the ones where you see a community have an overt and constructive outreach to a targeted set of people, a, a prioritized, sorry, target's a bad word, a prioritized set of potential vaccinees. They educate, they train the trainer really well, and they have a program that manages education of those who are vaccinated, access, and connection to the overall immunization system for the data. So the programs that are really successful, like for example, one particular community, did a concerted effort during flu season to vaccinate in the African-American community, all the people with underlying kidney disease, like they really focused on those people who had a serious risk, needed to be gotten over the hump on why they should get vaccinated. They leveraged a community center that was very popular and it was a great messenger. I see church-based ones that work like that. So I think that when I look at programs that are successful, it really calls upon the community and partnership with several different folks with very clear messaging getting people in a room and explaining why they need that outreach. And they often can drive quite significant improvements in vaccination rates from doing that. I think Another Phyllis, example, go ahead, Sandra. No, I, I was gonna say, I think Phyllis is, is right on. I think it's not so much, you know, what are the campaigns, but what are the characteristics of campaigns? And number one, knowing your target audience, doing the formative social and behavioral research to know who your target audience is. And to think about it, not just, okay, I want John Smith down the street to get vaccinated, but John Smith's providers are, hmm, hey, John Smith has diabetes. He sees an endocrinologist more than he sees anybody else. Todd's already told us, they're not necessarily the ones with the flu vaccine in their office. So, it's the target population and their, you know, their attitudes, their knowledge. We've found knowledge makes a difference, but also then it's everything around them. 
You know, what are the social norms? Are the social norms such that they support vaccination? Are the providers doing what they need to do? Do they make the recommendation and the offer at the same visit? Have we dealt with the issues of cost and accessibility and convenience? Because we find that those are things that approve, you know, that are barriers. So there's a communication aspect, but that alone will not solve this problem. There are also structural aspects with regard to access, cost, policy that also need to come into this as well. Just one comment, and then Todd may want to talk about this from the front lines, but there's a, a pediatrician in Seattle, Doug Opal, who's, who's tried to think about how best to guide the conversation. And rather than an open-ended question saying, you know, what are you worried about? He'll, he'll, he'll do a survey in the same way, way when you go to the doctor's office to fill out a, a, a history um, beforehand, he'll try to assess a parent's concern early on so they can use that to then guide what the conversation is. Um, because they'll want to find out what is it, what is it that's precisely worrying you and try to address that in a, in a way to, to engage in that conversation. I'm sure Todd does this 10 times a day. I mean, we've been trained in a, in a methodology called AIMS, which is announced, like you said, you, you tell them to get the vaccine, but then if you sense hesitancy, then you customize it to find out what is it that they're concerned about by inquiring, mirroring it so that they hear the, their concerns from you. They know that you know what they feel, which is feeling felt. And then you can really move to their side of the table to either get to vaccination or at least then as secure uh, which is uh, it's from the International Pediatric Association. It's a methodology to communicate in a, in a, in a, just like you're saying, Bruce, in a way to determine what is it that's concerning them, customize that visit. And don't forget 75% are vaccine accepting. So when you make the recommendation, three quarters are just saying, yeah, get it. So you can spend the, the rest of the time for those 23% in a more meaningful conversation with good active listening. Yeah, Thanks, Todd. Go ahead. Bruce, um, we're, we're gonna, I'd like to wrap things up. Everyone's going to have an opportunity for a closing statement. Uh, but was there something you wanted to get in right now? Nope. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Terrific. Um, so um, before we end, um, everyone on the panel provided me with some terrific resources. And you can find those. Um, I think some of them may have been in the chat, but they're also um, on our um, events page uh, under this panel. Um, and you can also reach out to us and we can provide you with those resources as well. So I'd love to hear a closing comment from each of you. Um, you know, one of the things that came up in our call last week was this isn't just about COVID-19. You know, there, the stakes for getting this right go beyond that. Um, what, what last thoughts would you like to leave with us and, and anyone in the policymaking community who's uh, tuning in? Let's start with Phyllis. Good. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say we start with Bruce. Um, so I think that the cornerstone thing we have to do is explain that this is a pandemic and we're trying to get back to normal. And I think to some degree we've lost some of that. It's hard. You have, I literally now even internally remind people, this is a pandemic. So like Bruce said before, we're going to know some things. We're not going to know some things. We need to clearly communicate. And since it's not necessarily happening across all leadership, we as a scientific and policy community need to start calling for that and doing it ourselves. Clearly communicate what we will and won't know. Um, that we're learning as we, that we're trying to learn as much as we can so they have as much information as possible, but distill the science down to things that people can actually really understand and help them with decision making and empower providers to do the same. Thanks, Phyllis. Well, let's go to Bruce next. Well, even if you get the movie title wrong, the bottom line is if you build it, they may not come. And I think, and, and I think particularly for the Research America audience, the amount of science that's gone into where we are right now is incalculable. It's, inc it's been really phenomenal. But if we don't understand how to turn science into health behaviors, not just for immunization, but for other things, we're spending a lot of money um, building the medical literature. And we're gonna need to make sure that we are addressing the behavior parts of health equally with the science part so we can marry up this incredible science with the behaviors that lead to the outcome we're looking for. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, let's go to Sandra next and then Todd. 
Yeah, I, I think, Jenny, I mean, this is complex, but I think there are a couple of critical things that I would like to see us um, do in addition to everything that's been said thus far. I would like to see more and more policymakers put their public health people front and center. And, and instead of, ele I should say, elected officials, you know, in particular, put their public health people front and center and let them speak. Um, I would like to see more role models among policymakers and elected officials. And finally, I would like to see more resources for local, state, territorial, tribal health departments for this. This is not going to be over on November 3rd. It's not going to be over for some time to come. And we are just struggling to keep up with which is what has been you know, a rocket speed escalation of illness and death. So we've got to get this right with regard to this vaccine because it will impact how we, what we see in terms of vaccination in the future for decades to come. Thank you, Sandra. Todd, you have the last word of our panelists. Uh, I would say don't squander our most precious asset, which is trust. Trust can beat fear, trust can beat bullying, and trust can even beat hate. But to do so, to leverage trust, we have to be taught to communicate more effectively face-to-face, -face, as well as virtually and online. And we have to use, have to use, it's not an option anymore. We have to utilize social media to get our message out and to connect to our broad communities. Wow. Well, what a terrific panel. I can't thank you enough. I know that there are people clapping all over the world um, and we can't hear them, but they're out there. Uh, this has been terrific. Um, thank you so much for joining the forum. Really appreciate it. Back yeah. to you, Derek. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Jenny. And thanks to all of you for uh, really driving home the point that it's not just about the science, that for us really to have the impact, we have to think about all these other factors too. Uh, and, and you did a great job, so thank you very, very much. Uh, we have one more program today, one that I promise is worth the wait. First, though, let me offer our thanks again to the sponsors who made this forum possible. First, our lead sponsor, Pfizer. Our panel sponsors, Advamed, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Elsevier, GlaxoSmithKline, Johnson & Johnson, Pharma, Regeneron, Sanofi, and UCB. And thanks also to today's host, Takeda Pharmaceutical Company. And thanks to our Fireside Chat sponsors, Bio and Picori. And to our Advocacy and Action sponsor, Eli Lilly and Company. To our Flash Talks competition sponsor, ASI. And our 20 Voices, Three Minutes, one Question Sponsors, the American Society for Microbiology, the Association of Clinical Research Organizations, Amgen, Colgate, and the Medical Device Manufacturers Association. Now on to our final segment of the day, of this first day, which will challenge your perspective on what medical progress means, and what it takes to achieve it. Head back to the auditorium and click on the join button for the segment, Think, Hope, and Inspiration. And then remember to come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern when we start again for our second day for a conversation with Secretary Azar. Thanks very much to all of you. <laughs>